Howdy. Welcome, everybody. Oh, hi. I'm a, I'm a big Good spider, morning. actually. This this is a beautiful little spider miniature. Hi. Uh, hello. Welcome to the happy anniversary, Starfinder, everybody. This is going to be your highest Yay! energy channel of forever, I assure you. Um, I will be your guide host mediator um counselor afterwards uh hi i'm like mediating Hillman. nothing yeah it's true i'm the moderator <laughs> for this uh i you am can't mediate uh, me. i can't i can't i am the senior digital developer here at paizo um i work uh, i used to work a lot with uh starfinder society which i i helped launch um have done a bunch of stuff for starfinder off and on and i am going to pass it over to my two panelists starting to the person immediately uh, to the right of me uh, jenny would you like to please introduce yourself Hello, uh, I am Jenny Jarzabski. I am a creative developer working on adventures in Starfinder land. Uh, I previously worked on Starfinder Society. Before that, I was a prolific freelancer for Paizo, working on both Pathfinder and Starfinder for, oh God, it's been almost like 10 years now. And uh, I've known both of these uh, these gentlemen here uh, quite a bit Ooh, we're gentlemen over the now. years. Oh, wow. Yes, oh yes. Um, well, hey, it's, it's early. I'm trying to be polite. So, uh, so yeah, long, long history of working with them as developers, uh, and now, of course, as co-workers. It's pretty cool. I'm John Compton. I'm Starfinder Senior Developer. Um, like Thirsty, I was in organized play when Starfinder was uh, getting created, and so primarily approached it from the organized play side of things uh, and joined the team uh, two years ago, three, three, three years ago, uh, give or take. Um, working on the hardcover book lines these days. Yeah, yeah. So so that's us. All of us have some, you know, some knowledge connection, maybe have been either, uh, you know, developing, wrote on the main book, or at least in some way uh, contributed. And we're going to go through, we're going to go, like, start with the way back when machine. As we go back in time, because it is the fifth anniversary of Starfinder, we are going to go back in the far back machine and see where Starfinder started, where we've gotten to in the meantime. We're going to go through everything everything um so buck buckle up because we're, we got we got a lot to talk about first of all i believe our first cool art piece was um the, the first time that we had uh we had starfinder really announce so if we can bring up this lovely yeah. art piece of absalom station i remember oh, seeing so this good. I remember seeing this. I believe this was first shown at the PaizoCon banquet the year before Starfinder was released. And um, yeah, I had some like inklings, it, like uh, there's like rumblings in the, the ether that the Paizo was going to do like a sci fi -y thing. I wasn't working with the company at the time. I was a freelancer. And I remember, yeah, being at that, that banquet and then going, oh, mm -hmm. I like I like spaceships. I like Pathfinder. <laughs> what if, oh, that looks like a spaceship and they're saying it ends in Finder. That's pretty cool. Um, and like it was it was a very, very impressive reaction from everyone. News spread quite quickly. And for following that, <laughs> following that, I ended up going uh, and meeting with the, uh, the creative director at the time, uh, James Sutter who was telling me all these things about Starfinder and all these like deep secrets because they were working on the game at that exact moment. It was like, we're going to have like this, this, this strange class called the Solarian that we're, we're working on. And I have all these like odd ideas for how we're going to handle deities. And like, I'll never forget this because Sutter looks, looks me in the eyes like thirsty. We want you to help us with this project. Cause we're getting in like a bunch of freelancers for it. Um, and I'm like, oh, good, that, that's great. Like, what, what, what sort of inspirations are you taking for this? And he was listing off and was like, oh, yeah. And like one, one thing that's really inspired us from like, you know, like a setting perspective is, have you ever heard of this game called Warhammer? And I like to like, <laughs> see my eyes just be like, yeah, <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, as I was like, you have my attention. Uh, and, and of course, we, we talked about like themes from various, you know, you Star Trek, you're your star wars your star gates it was it was uh, a very stars. very interesting so many. many 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 stars but that was my um first introduction to, to starfinder like the announcement and the oh my gosh um i guess like, i'm gonna go the opposite direction now john what was what was yours because you were like at the company at the time and yeah 
I, I think there are two two components uh, that I would want to touch on. The first is kind of a bit of follow-up to what you were just talking about, Thursday, because that was at PaizoCon you were having that discussion. By the time mm-hmm. Gen Con rolled around about, oh, at that point in time, it would, it would have been about like a month and a half later, um, uh, I had already been in some talks with Eric Mona um, and the like about like, you know, if you're starting up an entirely new organized play campaign, hang on, let's back up a sec. Hey, <laughs> Eric, this is going to have an organized play campaign, right? Like, we want to make a good decision and not a non-decision, right? And Eric was like, yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good, ha- that would be a good idea, John. I was like, hey, you know how, like, burnout is a thing and how we already have really full play sure would be good if we had another developer to do things oh yeah 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 that'd be a good idea oh you're agreeing to up the staffing oh thank goodness um do you have anybody in mind john well i mean let me think about some of the people i know who have uh i don't know saved our bacon about 27 times in the past calendar year uh thurston hillman he seems to like space um, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you should, we should talk to him. And so I remember approaching Thirsty uh, right before the Venture Captain dinner at Gen Con and being like, hey, buddy, you know how we work on like adventures together? And I sometimes uh, like huckster you into writing multi table interactive specials and you keep on for having amnesia and being like, sure, that sounds like a fun time that won't cause me to go bonkers uh, in the course of several month <laughs> period. Um, <clears throat> Oh, he's talking like about to... me. I'm just playing with a spaceship model. Pew, 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 I, pew, this pew, is how pew. most of our meetings go, frankly. I tried to cover business, and there's just like, pew, 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 pew. No, not today, villain. <laughs> uh, and that's how I knew he would be a great developer. Um, and so uh, we were able to, pro- I was able to uh, snooker in Thirsty the same way I was able to snooker him into a whole bunch of other projects just by providing him a little hint of ownership to uh, a future creative endeavor. And then by that point, he can't actually let go. Um, this is how our friendship works. This is how our professional relationship works. You, you know, uh-huh. it, it just what do. Um, so there's that aspect of things. But when, as far as my first exposure to Starfinder uh, went, uh, I remember hanging out with a couple of colleagues who at that time trying to s- develop their pitch for convincing the executives to consider Starfinder in the first place. A- and like there are a lot of times when Paizo's real good about being like, oh my gosh, new idea, let's jump on it. And there are a lot of times where it's like, it, it receives a little bit of resistance. And one of the uh, initial pushbacks I remember hearing secondhand um, about that initial resistance was, oh, I don't know, like laser guns and bows, like lasers are clearly better weapons than bows. Like, are you going to have lasers do different damage than bows? Like how is, how does, how do even design? Like that sort of initial pushback and, and, you know, we quickly got over that point, but, but there was that kind of like stuck in our fantasy realm, uh, a little bit of inertia that had to get overcome before everyone was like, ah, Starfinder, hmm, Starfinder, ooh, wait, I got it, Starfinder. Um, and then, you know, just sort of builds up from there. And you're going to find, uh, I think in, in some of our retrospective, there's th- that's a common theme of things where it's like, I don't know if that'll ever work. And like a year later, it's like, I saw her, I'm glad I had that idea. Um, so, so I got some of those initial splashes of things. And I was uh, there as the team, the initial teams were starting to be brought together with, with James Sutter and uh, Owen Casey Stevens and, and Rob McCreary as they kind of got drawn in. Oh, I see Jen is doing a few times Someone too. Someone else is playing. Yeah. Starship Jenny. combat. Um, Jenny, Jenny, what about, what about you? What about you, Jenny? How did, yes, how did you find hello. out about Starfinder and what, what got you into it? <laughs> Pew, pew. Hi, well, pew. I, uh, pew, pew, I was, I, I'm just in it for the pew, pew, lasers and missiles. Oh, um, honestly, at the time, I was just another of the, uh, the, uh, the usual suspects, aka freelancers who worked a lot with Paizo. And I, I was not, however, cool enough, um, re busy enough with Paizo work to know about anything like ahead of time. Like something like Starfinder, honestly, is something that would be kept under wraps to pretty much anyone who's not inside the company. So, you know, I found out about it like any other fan and Starfinder player, which was at that PaizoCon banquet when we saw that super cool art that Thirsty just reminded us of earlier. Uh, of hey, we have a second piece of art too. We can <gasps> show that we too. We do. Look, Ooh, can we get look, the we, art? We have, we have a we have a second piece of preview art that 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 was done. Look at that! Look at that! <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. About this one. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Android. My favorite Android. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. 
Oh, wow. that forth. is so Continue. cool looking. <laughs> Yes. So, okay. So basically I, I heard about it like everyone else and I got super hyped about it. And then when it came out, um, that Gen Con 2017, I've still got my button somewhere of, of like the Starfinder release. I remember talking to Thirsty and John because they were developers I'd worked with at the time about my idea for a Starfinder society scenario. And at this point, we literally <laughs> just found out about the game like we we just gotten the rules we were all still kind of like learning how to play it if we weren't in you know actual designers and developers working at paizo and we're con we're concepting this and i'm like so what if we have like a space paris hilton type person that the pcs have to babysit <laughs> and, uh, and this, that was this, the birth oh, of yeah. envar tam oh sorry thirsty go on <laughs> oh no i was just i was just gonna say and this like just really showcases how at the beginning of starfinder we were throwing everything at the wall and being like mm -hmm. wow we can we can do things that we could not do on ye old galarian planet um and and just some of the like those things like Envar Tam and the let's do Paris Hilton on a space station, um, were like that was like scenario what seven like that was that was early early yeah on. it was number yes. seven number seven mm -hmm. yeah I also learned an important lesson about starship combat design. Um, you're jumping on this you're jumping on this grenade before I I throw it at you very hey, smart hey, emphasis on explosives thirsty. Yeah, it's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> tell, what tell lesson did you learn? Design philosophy, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I learned that I, I learned that while some designers and developers might disagree with me, uh, a nuke boat, aka a CR one half uh, starship, like a tiny fighter, I believe it was with a uh -huh. with like nuclear missiles Several. strapped to it. <laughs> I I think that's great design. Yeah, this was uh, this was in the the but, uh, the proverbial Wild West days we had of like learning how game design and development worked in Starfinder. Because once we had the system, like it's one thing for us to even like and, and kind of rewinding the clock a bit from from where we got to. Um, there was a lot of like internal writing of on on the book and in like internal mm -hmm. play testing and such that happened uh before we we even launched the game so um kind of again like we're, we're back in time for a sec um i remember i was brought in originally to help with the uh, the environmental section of the core rule book which um i i wrote for and then um that went on to get development passed about internally uh and then shortly after that i was actually hired um to work for paizo to help launch the uh the starfinder society organized play alongside john and, and linda and the rest of the team um so then we kind of reached this point where john and i had to go through the core rule book before it went to print and there were these fun moments of john and i sitting down and reading through these rules which had certainly been been tested there were play tests that were run in the office um but like as people who had come from like a really heavy organized play background we certainly saw some things that made us go oh Oh no. oh no! This 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 needs to be fixed oh, before no. print. Like we we found some some fun little gems, which again, like if you're if you were playtesting it as a game, would have been fine. But we were looking at it from like a very particular perspective from one play. Um, and, and I think John wants to leap in here and probably has some of those anecdotes with which we I, found. I, I, I think one of the important things to keep in mind about Starfinder is that um, early on it had a somewhat generous window of, of design development, but there were, there were many stages of it that had to move real fast because there were certain, mm -hmm. uh, certain, uh, due dates that need to be hit, if, especially if we wanted to have it at Gen Con. We wanted to have it at Gen Con. It was very important to have it at Gen Con. Um, and so, uh, that meant like the playtesting uh, process. If you were here for the uh, playtesting panel right before this, um, we'd mentioned like how it had to be a closed uh, playtest. Um, it was some internal folks running playtests. It was some uh, friends with the community running playtests, etc. Uh, but we really need to have a tight turnaround uh, on that playtesting, which was like late November to mid January. So it's like, hope you had a fun Christmas. Please run Starship Combat uh, and tell us how it went. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, there, there was a lot of getting those. Um... What I'm trying to get at is that like certain phases had to be real fast and the organized play review stage of things was real fast it was like all right john and thirsty uh take the next week 
to get uh, read over the star or the Starfinder core rulebook and get us feedback because in about two and a half weeks we're shipping this to the printer. So Thursday night after going bug eyed and being like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah, we were finding a lot of those moments where it'd just be like, oh no, hey buddy. Hey, actually, sorry, the way the Thursday and I would tend to interact is like, <laughs> hey, buddy. And the other one immediately goes, oh, no, what? no, no, what? no. What? How are you going to hurt me today? And it'd be like, check out page 372. It's like, oh, no. Flip shit. What, what, what is this about? What is this about? Oh, no, no. And, and then we'd kind of, you know. Uh, we would we would go and we would meet with like owen and the designers and uh, also shout out to to owen casey stevens who was supposed to be on this panel but could not he was not uh, feeling well and we wish him a speedy recovery we love you Uh, owen hope you get better and and so as we say we love owen so john and i would rush to owen and now i kind of like semi throw him under a bus and be like owen what were we thinking um because there would be a few points especially if you come from an organized play background there were some really fun discoveries we made like all right, like how much does the the equivalent of a raised dead cost in this setting? Like player characters die. Let's find out. And so John and I do the math. In the original like book, it was you would you would have to reach eighth level and have never spent a single credit in order to come back from the dead. And we're like, that won't work. Yeah. That won't work at all. That, that, that will not work. And, 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 you know, not with the way the... people are playing those games out in a work play. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for some of the, for some of these things, it was like you know we'd bring the the issue to them and and lay it out in a very professional way, and and every once in a while yeah, we'd feel a little bit more impish and we'd be like, so uh, what what do you want to see about uh, player or PCs being brought back from the dead? Well, we were thinking you know they should be able to raise them from the, themselves from the dead x many times and so, such and such. It's like open the PDF. Are you sure? Is that really what you think? Uh, level of thing. Um, or like when we had uh, a big resolve point issue, because like a lot of our stuff that Thirsty and I picked out during that read through was like, how easy is it going to be to die? Because that's what we're going to, one, get a whole bunch of angry letters about in org play. And two, mm-hmm. when we launch this thing in org play, we want to make sure that people have the most splendiferous experience full of sparkles and magic. And that they say, we Lots want to do Starfinder Society forever from now on. Uh, forever we don't want and them ever to. And ever. Ex- exactly. <laughs> we don't want them to die within two hours and say, well, that's dumb. We're never trying this again. So, like, one of the ones was. Uh, Resolve points while dying um, oh, was yes. a thing that had was the thing that combined with uh, grenades and area of effect, where it was like every time that any sort of damage happened, then uh, 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 you'd be losing resolve points. We were just like, so under these circumstances, especially since you want people to be using grenades willy nilly, like we're just going to have collateral damage vaporizing the first person who gets knocked to zero hit points. Uh, that is a bad experience. Or um, yeah, <laughs> uh, or, or or grenades uh, and spellcasters. Uh, uh, yeah. Grenades and spellcasters. Grenades and spellcasters. Yep. Where, yep. Yep. where uh, it was like, uh, hey, as long as a spellcaster takes at least one point of damage, then their spell is interrupted. This basic first level frag grenade does a d6 damage reflux for half. So if I roll a two on the damage, I can disrupt the the spellcasting of a twentieth level enemy spellcaster. Is this what we want? I would ask in sort of a this isn't what we want, right? Sort of way. Um, and and like one of the really important things since Thirsty evoked Owen Casey Stevens um, is that Owen and I in particular had a really positive relationship when he was working on uh, player companions, Pathfinder player companions, where he always wanted to know about what made it into additional resources, what didn't and why. So we could have a frank and really collegial discussion over design philosophies and, and what works well for organized play and what doesn't. And so, you know, even when we're kind of like poking each other in the uh, metaphorical ribs, um, we, we're doing so in a really productive, productive way. And, and so he was one of the best design partners we could have asked for in Starfinder's development, yeah. especially at that organized play review stage. Um, so he was always able to look past the like us being imps and trolls and, and, and hear what it was that we were actually saying uh, and work with it. Yeah, and and so we 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 got through all of 
all of that process, so to speak, and eventually made our way back to, you know, the, okay, now now we we're, we're, we're skipping forward. Now that the book is released, like John and I have done our pass, and Fast now we're, we're sending it out to people. Yeah, yeah. And so then, <laughs> because we weren't done done ragging enough on it, so then we're, we're having to do these scenarios and, like, seeing how things are working in the wild. Cut, yeah. to, cut to one Jenny Jerzabski, who sends Hi, in this, what, this what? turnover, <laughs> who sends in this beautiful turnover Aww, that I'm, I'm going through, you. and I'm like, it's great like this is awesome there's a lot of fun stuff it's one of the the favorite like character moments i think and Aww. then i get to like the final encounter which is an optional encounter don't worry jen here come here comes the drop okay now you're um, gonna talk okay, and it's God. like here, here's here's the tiny fighters with like nuclear missiles attached to them. And the I'm like, okay, to okay 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 um <sighs> as and so like as a developer in a system that really hasn't got a lot of public playtesting yet we haven't we're only by this point starting to get like the feedback coming in about the game um we're also sort of seeing um because because how how our like development works internally is we oftentimes are working on stuff several months before it gets out there so we're working on the next thing not even knowing how some some of the game is going and so i'm i'm developing jen's scenario here and i see these these tiny fighters that have nuclear missiles on them and i'm only ragging on this so much because i'm like <laughs> oh this this could like blow up blow up the player's ship like if you get like a couple good rolls the player's ship is just gone the end yeah, and yeah. this like raised this raised the no no this raised an <laughs> issue we had though because suddenly yeah. we were sitting there and i remember john and i having a discussion of like oh we really need to like think about what happens when we blow up starships like Listen, like they knew the dangers play, of going into space yeah, thirsty yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in org play, it's like it's been typically like okay, if an encounter fails, there's usually like a fail forward, and our adventures have like a lot of lives. But it, but in organized play, it was like, well, what happens if we're we're doing the starship combat and the players lose? Like, like is that it? Just game? Like, and we had to have like talks about how we did handle that, and it led to some some really fun discussion. I, I'm sure, like Jen, as you were. Um, like writing that, I know. Like we would have talks because that that was not mm -hmm. something that even came to me in the the final. I believe that was like a milestone moment where it was like, oh, okay, oh, this like... could be real bad. Yeah, and there's actually been a couple other times you've even saved my bacon. Like just my my early dev uh, my early dev work. There's been a few times like I've shown you an encounter, or we've play tested or talked about it, and you've been like, hey, have you considered that a you know a first level um, envoy has probably like maybe six or seven hit points easily, and this this would just kill them like outright. You know, um, we there's there's just certain things like that that as a developer, it is your job to look out for like what and and like you just get these interesting moments where you know, okay, at a table, this could turn out um, uh, very, very, very poorly and lead to a not fun experience, which is not what we want. So um, especially in the organized play where we want to encourage people to come back and keep playing our game and spread the word. So, so yeah, uh, as, as much as I joke about it, uh, all the all the Wahoo writers out there who want to put little tiny nuke boats out there need someone like Thirsty or John or now I guess me I guess I have to I'm in this you're gonna be the adult <laughs> yeah uh, be the adult. I have to be an adult now too dang it <laughs> but we need that <laughs> yeah and so this was this was kind of our, our our launching point and like not to not to fast forward through stuff but we kind of uh, from there hit really like a breakneck pace of releases um we had adventure paths that were coming out i mean dead sons was being released at the same time we had alien archive that came out as well and then from there like the hardcover line started uh producing more and more along with the adventure path line and during this this point uh for organized play we actually amped up to two scenarios a month that was a big uh -huh. change that we did just because the like the desire for starfinder was was really strong it, and and people people wanted more and we were we were putting out content on, on a fairly regular pace i mean we went through what was essentially um like pack rolls armory and then two alien two more alien archives with a beginner box in between uh i i know for for my standpoint um at that point i was so in organized play my contributions were mostly as 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 a freelancer, I, I think Jenny, your first contribution on that was um, when Alien Archive Three was was I think one of the first like hardbacks you you contributed to for Starfinder. I think right. I think so. It all I blurs together as far as what freelancer. Does. 
I, d- I was quickly looking through like author credits. Yeah, too, because and I'm like, I did. When did, when did, I did Jenny a first of, do a hardcover? Yeah, because I did a couple of SFS adv- um, adventures. Uh, I know I did Calm, but I think that was that was after. So yeah, I think Alien Archive Three was the first Starfinder. Hardback, but you'd also done Adventure something. Paths too. Um, yeah, and, and in that period, there was also like we had packed worlds that was going on. I know I wrote, I, well, I know John wrote Akaton for that. Um, mm-hmm. I took on Abalon, the machine planet. Uh, Armory Knocked that came out of out, the I park, think... honestly. I'm a big fan. Uh, but anyway, a- a- Akaton's one of my favorite places. Big, big old red Mars planet. What, what, one of the things that you were uh, hitting on there, Thursday, the, uh, the, the, the rate of release. Um, yeah. So Pathfinder and Starfinder now exist as largely equal co-conspirators in the grand Paizo scheme of things, but Starfinder was very much an experimental thing in a way. Like behind the scenes at that point, uh, we were already internally spinning up uh, Pathfinder second edition design in big, big ways. Um, and so Starfinder was kind of a let's let's try out something in this, this in this uh, not yet the interregnum period um, and and see what sticks. And and Paizo took a somewhat conservative approach to its publication speed at that time. Um, whereas like we we cannot we cannot shift around our existing staff so much that we can provide like every month a new thing, but we can at least get the main touchstones of the Paizo role-playing game experience in this new brand. So we're going to have hardcover books. We're going to have adventure paths every other month. We're going to have scenarios. Granted, we're only going to do one a month rather than two, like Thirsty referenced spinning those up later. Um, And for a lot of those things, um, uh, like Thirsty and to a much lesser extent, I are kind of like prophets of are you sure you don't want more uh, sort of things? Like I remember us uh, look, looking to Eric, looking to uh, Tanya and the like and being like, I don't think one scenario per month is going to be enough to sustain an organized play program. People kind of want a um, little bit more, don't you think? And it's like, hmm. eh, we'll, we'll, we'll assess a little bit later on. And by, by the point that we could even start to change gears, it was, you know, we were already about umpteen scenarios in and it was just like, Okay, now hit the accelerators. Like, okay, now we're going to do all the adventure path volumes ever. Um, and and yeah. once it was clear, like how successful Starfinder was, even that first day of Gen Con when we sold out of like ninety five percent of our stock, um, we, there's already that like spin up time and the spin up staff to to make those new products that that we had to do. Um, so Starfinder kind of started slow and then lurched real fast forward uh, as it jumped into the drift. Yeah, we we and we like I was saying we we started hitting on a, a lot of books. The the game itself really hit its stride, and um, I, I think I think where where I think like one of the the critical moments of that, even though it was a couple you know it was a couple of years down the line, um, and I think we have an art piece for this was 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 the release of the character operations manual, which mm, yeah. to me is yeah. one of like the absolute most important books we have released uh, for for Starfinder to date. Uh, let it be known uh, as a GM <laughs> that cover is great as a GM mm-hmm. uh, my 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 personal love is like big crunchy rule books and this was like the mm-hmm. first time we really did a big crunchy rule book that was focused almost primarily on on rules and had three new classes and you know options for different like species and feats and items and all sorts of things this book i think really gave um players both like an organized play home campaigns gms it gave them like a, just a an added depth of field of what they could do with the game and i think it really kind of a like solidified starfinder in a lot of in a lot of ways um to to me it also it also had had more fun behind the scenes stories. Now, uh, J- John, please forgive <laughs> me. I'm, I, I know you were on the playtest panel uh, previously. Um, please, by all means. There's but, got but I, there I, somebody I, under the bus. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, right. No. no, 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 no. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Did you, did, you, uh, did you talk on the previous panel? Did you talk much about the uh, the comp playtest? Oh, uh, we talked about how uh, after the closed playtest of the Starfinder Core rulebook, we uh, really started to work more closely with the Pathfinder design team in order to 
uh, evolve our standards, to ask more pointed questions rather than just being like message board post. Here is Le Witch Warper. What yeah. think? Um, Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Because I, I was I, at the time, um, Jenny was was with me. Oh, we were uh, we were doing a show, a Starfinder mm -hmm. Stream game, um, our, our our Punch and Crawl, which I think you can still find in Paizo's uh, can, like, in Twitch fact. libraries. So you can yes. you can find and watch as as I GM that that show of wow we did a lot um but during that one of the players was playing a technomancer and really <laughs> liked the flavor of the witch warper and um they were like oh man we could try out the witch warper i'm like yeah sure we'll switch you over we did a whole thing in game but it was a really great learning opportunity for like me and the witch warper uh because i i got to see the class like in play during the play test period and so then when it came time to do development um did, like the, the development internally on that and take that play test feedback for for calm um i got to go directly to, to owen and i remember sitting down with owen and being like okay here is here is the laundry list of stuff i have that i like like that i would like to have changed like this maybe isn't good this isn't bad uh yes yes wing breaker in chat uh like i'm throwing <laughs> truck coon at you because he was the one who was playing uh the witch warper in our campaign and um but all, all i'm gonna say is I'm, I'm sorry for some of the things that happened i didn't i didn't intend for it to be to be that much of a, of a shift of the witch warper i swear uh but i i actually you really, didn't really mean to love the witch warper that much <laughs> I did. I did not mean to to warp the witch warper that much. Um, but it was one of those things of like that was that was a community based moment for a lot of people because I have a lot of mm -hmm. people who speak fondly of those playtests. They go back in and say, "Oh, like I really like how you know, or I really like how like the witch warper's um, alternate realities change, or it was really cool to see something like you know." how my biohacker worked before and then like the small tweaks that happened uh into it and that was my first time um i'm sure john will get like the devilish grin that was my first time being in organized play as a developer and having to go through a play test period where There's people that could grin. play classes <laughs> and that's that was an experience for me um but that was that was like my, my job role like on a personal level i engaged with that um that play test a lot just as like a fan of the game who was like running the game at the time and i think that was yeah that was like a really big stepping stone for the game in a lot of ways uh and it kind of brought us into that uh that sort of next generation of books uh that started coming out next because following that we had like near space coming out uh mm -hmm. which was you know ha sure had a, a lot of like information on things that people had been really making up Loron up until that point. Uh, my, myself, John, and Jenny included, uh, because some of the lore that appeared for the Vescarium was the result of one of our games at uh, at, at a PaizoCon. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the not, all not even, not even table. I mean, there's the all Obazaya table, but even uh, that first Gen Con uh, with Starfinder releasing, when uh, the three of us and several others uh, kind of gathered in a hotel room after that that night's uh, multi-table interactive special had ended, and we're just kind of joking about things that <laughs> we assume are true about Vest. So we're like coming up with the idea of this: oh, we should sit, we should all make Vest characters and sit down and like basically uh, 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 troll some uh, hapless Starfinder Society GM's table because we all have a all Vesk jug band. Um, and then we're like, Do Vesk have we lips? Can. Doesn't matter. Make a, make a jug band anyway. And then we like started joking about Vesk being a tonal language. And, yeah. um, mm -hmm. And you're just like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like good world building. Uh, we brought that to the uh, creative director uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, Rob. And we're like, Rob, we've decided that Vesk is a tonal language. No, I, I, I don't know what, I don't know if that, I, I don't see why it needs to be like that. <laughs> Oh, come on, Rob, come on, come on. And, and I think this uh, speaks to kind of the- And he did come back to us later impishly to be like, okay, guys, I made it a tonal language, which is why you'll <laughs> see that in your space. <laughs> and, and I think that's, um, I think there's a really important uh, pattern in how uh, Starfinder's design and flavor has kind of evolved and developed explored itself explored its feelings it's like a it's like a teenager who's uh entering yeah. college and and uh going through freshman year and being like oh i'm not i'm not the velvet victorian of my old school and hey what what do i feel about my own identity and uh yes i will try this thing over here etc 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 or going to the therapy for the first time whatever our baby is i'm getting up 
<laughs> I know, but the thing is that, uh, like, uh, in particular with with Rob McCreary, uh, who's creative director of Starfinder for a while, there's there's this fun pattern that we kind of recognized where when we first introduced something that was kind of on the goofier side, then he would be initially resistant, uh, but over time, especially as the community would start to speak about it more and more. Uh, emphasis on more thirsty uh then La. he would like internalize <laughs> it and learn to love it was there something that really encapsulated that for you buddy yes yeah, psychedelic space walruses thanks to oh, yeah. Baker. uh this and, and, and this was this was yeah this was one of those again things that came out of a scenario um like an early org play scenario and this was actually a big difference for starfinder versus pathfinder i think at the time and how how the two programs were interacting with with their core lines starfinder was way more because it had less products going out starfinder was way more willing to like crib notes from organized play and like we would see a lot of things where you know, a species would get introduced in org play and then it would later show up in an alien archive. And it happened repeatedly, in fact. Um, the Morla Maws were the first, as, as John is, is uh, walrus tusking me. Um, <laughs> so so Kate Baker's writing the scenario uh, and she makes a pitch to me. And again, this is like, you know, the, the usual freelancer dev expanded like outline feedback pitch stage. And Kate's like, I was thinking this species could be psychedelically patterned space walruses and i'm like okay cool let's do it like also i i need to mention this scenario is also kind of like a like horror zon kuthon body so like like of course she's like also i want space was like psychedelic space walruses I'm like, okay and so we we introduced the species but then we go kind of the step further and we're like what if we had a what if we had a chronicle sheet on this that made them playable which we did which we did <laughs> and um people like suddenly the society was full of space walruses and like they became the most like like important thing and i uh, like again john's our talking about the evolution weird. oh our yeah. community's awesomely weird and great but i <laughs> yes. i remember having like rob come up to me after being like okay from now on i really need to be like in the loop on new species da, 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 da. and like the evolution over the course of like the next year was hilarious because then i come to paizo's offices for before PaizoCon. it's the banquet we're announcing i think it was alien archive three and rob uh -huh. comes up he's like thirsty i've got like I've got to to make some announcements for like Alien Archive Three. We've only got a few slides. I was thinking people would really react well to more Lamas. I'm like, yeah, Rob. Yeah, I think they would. He's like, yeah, I thought so too. They're pretty cool. I'm like, yes, they are. Yes, they are. And then yeah. then we cut to like Gen Con a few months later, and like he comes up, he's like, thirsty. We're talking about doing Starfinder minis, and I'm thinking, what do you think about Morlam? I'm like, we we have we have we have yeah. gone to the end of the extreme here, and that that was really what like Starfinder was was all about in the, in that in that stage, and you know, kind of kind of where we got to um, at that point, and like how how it had evolved. Uh, and again, I know this was when like Jen was getting way, way more involved on the freelancing side. I know you, you did like Signal of Screams and a few, mm -hmm. few other uh, things around there. And this was when you were also getting involved in the hardback line, correct? Yeah, I so making um, up time. Yeah, I wrote Signal of Screams. Yeah, time. I don't even. I don't even know. Time is hard for me now. Heck, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. It, it moves in a linear fashion, but. Yeah, I wrote Signal of Screams. I did start working more on the hardcovers. Like, um, I actually did some de uh, development work, a contract dev credit I have on a uh, Starship Operations Manual. And then, I, but that was, I think we're, I'm skipping ahead in, in eras here, but it, it truly does all blur together <laughs> once you've written yeah, for, uh, for the line for a while. <laughs> Yeah, because that was that was the evolution. Like you, you kind of like I knew you're in near space as well, and this does bring us to. Yes. And I, again, I see I That's see right. John chomping at the bit here of Starship Operations Manual, which I think was a book that oh, yes. like you was one of your first ones when you moved from organized play. The very first project that I had, yeah. Uh, well, not quite true. I helped a little bit with the tail end of near space, but basically, okay. Um, one of when we when we look at between Starfinder and Pathfinder, Pathfinder has had uh, s several really consistent uh, designers and, and setting figures 
um, who have been there from basically the whole start. Uh, Starfinders had a fair amount of team uh, turnover as, as people find cool new opportunities or, or need to leave for other reasons. Um, so there's been, so while Thirsty and I were there from more or less the beginning, we were there from the organized play perspective. Um, but there's very little of that original team that uh, was doing the very earliest work on Starfinder still at the company. And so by the time that uh, I joined the team, um, we had had some of that turnover. We had kind of a project that had lost its its champion. Um, and I was brought in to kind of uh, set that right and put my own spin on it for Starship Operations Manual. Um, but I already also had a whole bunch of the manuscripts for it, um, including a pile of Starship weapons. and. Um, one of the things that I asked about really early on was like, okay, well, now that I'm going to start working on these Starship weapons, um, what, 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 what internal documentation do we have for these, uh, for, for how we do the calculations on these guys? Um, and I got some, uh, kind of stares like, um, let, a, let me look for that. And eventually I was brought like one of the alpha playtest documents for Starship combat and it's like, this is the only thing I could find. It's like, okay. So what you're saying is we need to have some internal design guys for Starship weapon damage. Um, and, and I think that's that's one of the uh, products of, of how Starfinder had to come together in certain design bursts of speed, um, is that it had some really aggressive design periods and while that allowed us to create a lot of really awesome stuff, it didn't always allow us the time that was needed to provide the full documentation behind the scenes. And so the last several years have been um, really a, a fun renaissance of um, building all of those uh, design guides, going back and being like, whoa, tracking weapons, sure, tracking weapons sure do a lot of damage. The, those nukes, damn, we, we were right when Jenny was putting them on starships and we said, please, no, not today. Oh, God. <laughs> We want, to have, we want to have an organized play campaign, um, but uh, but but it's, it's it's kind of that like um, intergenerational wisdom that that institutional knowledge. Um, some of it we've been able to do a lot of those great handoffs. Some of it uh, less so. But even in the places where we aren't able to pass off knowledge from uh, one one generation of design to another, we've had uh, really excited people coming in to put their own spins on it and, and have Starfinder's flavor continue to evolve, um, including in that, make it just a little sparklier, a little bit goofier, a little bit more whimsical each year, because it's a, one of the places Starfinder just thrives so much. Um, you want to know where else Starfinder thrives? Oh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, no, I actually, I'm curious what your hook was going to be, um, but I, my, I wanted my to- hook yeah. Oh, good. No, nope. no, no, you Go finish. Okay, you finish. You finish. You finish. You, you. <laughs> I was going to say, I wanted to just to jump in real quick on this idea of a renaissance in Starfinder because I feel that we're having that as well, but in terms of our setting, because now, um, again, with having lost some of our old team, which is, it's, you know, there's, it's a mixed thing, right? Because in some ways that it means the game can grow and go in a new direction. And in other ways, there are things we've lost to the gap and there's great institutional knowledge and experience and voices that, you know, have moved on and we wish them the best, but I am very excited to have been someone who's been part of this as an author, like mostly on the adventure front, um, APs and scenarios. But now, you know, I'm in charge of more adventures and and working alongside uh, and under Jason Keeley, who's who's also working on adventures, of course. But I get to be part of the world building too. Um, we we have these meetings, these creative meetings, where we come together as a team and talk about ideas for the next books and the next products and what we want to do with our setting. And I'm actually getting to implement things that I have always wanted. And I know the community um, has talked about and, and just kind of expand on those in actual books um, as appropriate and as the rest of the team agrees with. And it's just really cool. It really does feel like being part of a renaissance for Starfinder. What, what, one of the things that I'll add to what you just said there, Jenny, is mm -hmm. that um, it, it can take a little while as a developer who just joins, has joined the team 
for the publication cycle to reach the point where your impact is made public. Yeah. And for you, Jenny, I yes. feel that you're just reaching that point now where the things Absolutely. that you started working on when you first joined the team are now seeing public light. And so when people go out and buy the latest and greatest Starfinder stuff, you're seeing a whole lot of Jenny's thumbprints on this. Um, uh, a lot of those thumbprints <laughs> involve, or fingerprints involve uh, giant robots stomping on things. Um, because <laughs> that brings us to our last art piece. That's our last, <gasps> yes! our last art piece. Mac yeah. McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's, McDonald's. <laughs> this so so as as we were we were kind of going going through and and talking about like starship operations this this is the this renaissance period we've we've entered with John being fully engaged with the team now. Um, you know, obviously, like Jason Keeley, um, Joe Pacini, uh, Jake Tondro at the time, um, we were we were really spooling up for for several new books. And one of the one of the most fun discussions I remember being a part of was talking about tech revolution, which was going to have mechs in it. And I remember sitting down and <laughs> us having these amazing brainstorm session meetings about yeah. mechs in the game. And the art you just saw there was by Paizo's own um, Kent Hamilton. Um, who like i i does, I, does I, I cannot for us. i cannot and stress how cool talented. it was yeah i cannot stress how cool it was being in that meeting though and at one point we were we were riffing on what the the the, the image you just saw the the corpse fleet mechs we were riffing on like different ways they could look and kent was making adjustments in photoshop during the meeting and showing this to us and we're all like oh yeah we really like that or oh okay That's maybe cool. not that and well, there, what there if it had so more many, legs? Like, yeah, exactly, right? Or like, well, well, what if like the legs were like going both ways? Like we tried all sorts of weird stuff, and it was it was great, and that was something that just like, and I know Jenny is very passionate about mechs, um, but that was something that like <laughs> really inspired all of us because we were just very excited to get that out there, to get the to get the rule system out there, and again, it's it's a bit of a different type of rule system. Um, which John had had a hand in, in in writing up. I think you you and Amanda did did basically all that. Yeah, and it's a system that like now we're finally able to start exploring. You're seeing like the module uh, to defy the dragon coming out with next. We uh, Tondro put it in uh, Great Grav Train. There's even a little bit mm -hmm. of like we're starting to see some of those things pay off. And with Starfinder, it's gonna be SFS I think, scenarios. I think with a mech. Yeah, they're 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 actually they're, yeah. they're, they're I saw There's I saw an art really of, cool cat really, mech. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. And like this. This sort of like continues on into things we've also wanted to expand on, um, like galactic magic now, which is expanded on our deities mm -hmm. and a lot of the setting information has an okay class in it. Like it's 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 a great book. <laughs> Just you know? okay. Who could have foreseen? Just okay. Who could have foreseen the precog? Um, and that <laughs> now, like to to sort of hit our quote unquote. Uh, our exciting future in the future uh now we have drift crisis which uh, we don't need to get into more of the drift crisis you probably heard a lot about drift crisis this weekend already but it's it's really that that step that's taking us forward right like this is the this is the exciting new thing that like we we've been working on behind the scenes for you know over a year or whatnot now and now it's finally seeing light and we're 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 having that moment again of like how is this going to work what is going to be the new small nuclear missile boat of the drift crate like like the all these things <laughs> that we are going to learn yeah. and it, it's really it's a really exciting um time for us to to be in and just like with all of these new products i think as well even with stuff we've announced too like uh interstellar species and some of the unannounced stuff we mm -hmm. haven't talked about that you're all going to be super excited when you hear about and we're going to tell you about it and oh my gosh i can't wait to tell you about it this is me just being a giant tease but i don't care right now because it's so cool okay um <laughs> but I, I i i think i think i think that does kind of kind of bring us a little bit to to near the end of our presentation for today but 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 i will uh pass it over to my co my my co host to give some some outro lines and some things they want to touch on before we have to go um and i picked on the far side last time so i'm gonna pick on john first thank you hang on i am on the far side of things okay fine 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 fine, fine. Right. uh yeah so drift crest is really exciting we're really looking at uh we're really excited to be looking at how the setting is has been presented and how it can be presented going forward and starting to ask some of the big questions of like, who are the threats? What is the story of the Starfinder setting? Um, so we can start to, to, to establish and 
uh, present more of the touchstones of what the, the campaign setting really presents, while also providing uh, players and uh, player characters an opportunity to really mess with, save, uh, be a part of those ongoing storylines. Um, so just just ongoing evolution of our, our narrative design and setting design is really exciting to me. And Drift Crisis is a cool new experiment in how that works out. So we're all of us on the team are really excited to hear about how people use that book, how people are telling their own uh, Drift Crisis stories using the adventure seeds, or even just inspirations from that book to create something entirely new. Uh, because this is a format of storytelling that we think could be really exciting and even a model that we adapt and try again in the future. Absolutely. Jen. Hey, yeah, I'm, that? I'm just going to echo what we've been talking about and say, I'm just really excited to be at a time when I'm seeing uh, some of my colleagues and mine, my voices like really start to come out in the products. Uh, like John mentioned, um, just to kind of toot my own horn a little bit, like the first module that I outlined, developed, et cetera, will be coming out this November. And before that, I have another, uh, I have one of the Drift Crashers AP volumes, uh, number two nightmare scenario that I actually wrote, um, as well as by just some some serendipity that maybe Desna herself set up. I don't know. I ended up also developing the uh, the back matter, which mostly consisted of me and Isabel Lee, one of our freelancers, just kind of going ham on magical girls, Church of Desna, um, a couple other little little fun things thrown in there. So I'm just really excited, like I said, to have this influence now and to see it coming to be, to see it materializing and to just keep keep pushing forward and listening to the community, like all of you in the chat who play these games just like we do and who love them, just seeing like, what, what do y'all think of it? Like the Drift Crisis, it is our big experiment and I'm super excited to see where that goes. And I'm excited to hear about the stories you tell and kind of which becomes the, uh, the canon community uh, reason for the drift crisis and yeah also um i'm excited about more pew pew lasers and ships Whee! Pew, hey thirsty pew, pew, what are you excited about all right oh oh what am i excited all right all right well well to end uh yeah. i am i am very <laughs> excited ahem <laughs> about remember that stuff i said i can't talk about that i absolutely can't talk about but i'm really excited for it uh one of the weird things about despise con has been um i'm i'm working on some stuff that we did not announce uh and in fact starfinder related stuff that has not been announced yet which i think a lot of our community will really like uh there are some some big big things happening on the starfinder side um that i'm i'm really excited in the coming months so when we when like Jen and John are talking about, you know, our future and this, this Renaissance period, there's, there's more to come. Um, I know we've, we've sort of like a lot of you who are super fans have probably already picked apart our product pages and knew a lot of the, the announcements and things we, we push, but really what we've been talking about with drift crisis is this thing that is so ex exciting to us. And even though it's like the new book and many of you have it already, it's more than just a book to us. It is something that is going to go forward in, in, in the setting and really help us establish, you know, what things we're going to try out and what works, what doesn't work. Um, but there's also more, and that's kind of where I wanted to, to leave off on is if you're a starfinder fan don't worry there's there's more coming and some of this stuff is um experimental some of it's really radical and new whether you're someone who's playing the game uh for you know new and unique styles of adventures whether you're someone who's looking for hardcore mechanics to run in your own game like there is stuff coming for all of you and we are so excited for what the next five ten 20 years is going to bring. But uh, that is our panel for today. We are going to be off on the Discord. Uh, you can find us in the uh, yeah. Happy Anniversary Starfinder. If someone wants to toss the Discord link in there, you can uh, you can get it in the chat. We will be around there. We will be around the convention. Um, and just thank thanks again, everybody, for, for coming, for being fans of Starfinder, for supporting us. And again, we look forward to showing you what we've got over the next five years and beyond. So thank you, everybody. Have Thank you.